The middle of the Pacific Ocean, July 1937. The largest and most expensive hunt in history is on. The United States Coast Guard vessel Itasca leads the hunt, with the USS Colorado and the USS Lexington, four destroyers and a minesweeper following. The Lexington, an aircraft carrier, also provided air support, scouring the ocean with 62 planes. The Japanese Navy even got involved, providing support for the Americans. They searched for 16 days, ultimately to no avail. But what exactly were they searching for? Two people and a plane, that's all. It wasn't just any pilot, however. This was the babe of the sky, Amelia Earhart. Mystery abounds to this day as to what happened to Amelia and her navigator, Fred Noonan. And this week on Cheeky Tales, we're going to cover their disappearance and all that surrounds it. Hello and happy anniversary, boy. Happy anniversary, boy. This is not exactly a year that this will be uploaded. It is, what will it be, the 19th? So it will be three days prior to a year since we uploaded our first episode. One happy, cheeky anniversary year. That is exactly how I'd like it to be said. Um, hashtag cheeky, cheekiversary. Cheekiversary. Happy cheekiversary, boy. <laughs> yeah, well, welcome back, boy. Um yeah, I'm I'm hitting all of our classics. It's it's 1930s. 1930s. There's a plane. There's a plane. There's ships. There's the ocean. It's someone's biography. At one <laughs> at, at one point, I say expedition. Nice. Oh, oh yes. It. Yep. Yep. It's uh yeah. This is a good one. This is uh this is the babe of the sky, um the the queen of the Atlantic, other various things relating to the ocean. Yeah. So, do you know much about? Ms. Earhart. I do know about Ms. Er- Ms. Earhart. Yeah. I know quite a bit about Ms. Earhart. Yeah. It's actually Mrs. Earhart. She was married but didn't mm. take the name. Correct. Mm. Not that I mentioned that at all. I had I have <laughs> listened to another podcast where they go into her disappearance and subsequent searching and what went wrong. Was that Red Web? Yes, it was Red Web. Okay. Well, great. I guess you're going to know it all. <laughs> but the listeners, boy. The listeners. Yeah. This one. This one's good because it is a mystery. Um. In, in unsolved s- mystery. Is this is, our first unsolved mystery? Uh, I mean, the Titanic's not really solved, is it? <laughs> uh, I believe it is. Uh, you can't prove it is, wasn't. Is Roswell? You can't an prove it. You can't mystery? prove it wasn't the mummy. Um, Roswell. Mm. I mean, <laughs> that wasn't it. That was a balloon, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, it was really. It was a yeah. First unsolved mystery. Yeah. This is one of the stories that has been requested a couple of times. By the uh, same person. <laughs> our mate our mate from, from the UK, Reese. Mm-hmm. So I am glad that we're finally getting around to doing it. On the cheek anniversary. On the cheek anniversary. Also, we have a beer again. Happy cheek anniversary, Reese. Cheers, boy. Don't spill it on my new couch. Well, you didn't put it in a sippy cup. It's your own fault if I spill it. <laughs> Cheers, boy. Cheers, boy. So let's, uh, let's get into it. Who was... Amelia, and pilot. why do we know about her? What? She was a pilot. She was a pilot. Who was Fred? N- no, um, Fred Astaire. <laughs> Fred Noonan. Oh. Mm. Did you remember the other guy that went missing? No. Yeah, no one does. A bit sad. Amelia Mary Earhart was born on July twenty fourth in Kansas to parents Samuel and Amelia Earhart. She had a younger sister, Grace. Not that their mother raised them to be nice little girls. Their mother didn't believe in conventional roles for girls, and it's thought that this gave Amelia her adventurous and independent nature, which would later serve her well when she rose to fame for her exploits. She would become known for being a rough-and-tumble kid, often called a tomboy for her antics as she hunted rats with a rifle, climbed trees, and in general, put herself in danger. You find that funny, did you, boy? I I love the idea, because, like, I know that it'll be, like, a BB gun or something. Yeah. But I'm picturing, like, a massive hunting rifle (laughs) with a scope. Elephant rifle. Yeah. (laughs) 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 This rat just Uh, exploding. 308. There's a rat. (laughs) Boom. I like that. Um, It does sound fun. I do want to get a bug assault. You know what we never got? I want to get a bug assault. I want to get a bug assault. So bad. The bug assault is a- Oh, we should explain it, shouldn't we? It's a little- It's like a a water pistol. Yes, and you fill it with like table salt. But it shoots table salt to kill bugs. Flies. 
Yeah. I mean, mainly flies. Yeah. So, imagine you're just like hunting a fly with a gun. And when you see it, you shoot it with salt. And all that's left is salt. I want one and so a bad. And splattered fly. <laughs> yeah. I want one. I do want one. Despite these seemingly idyllic conditions, there was turmoil in her early years. Her father struggled with alcoholism throughout her youth, and the family would struggle to make ends meet financially. They would move often, with Amelia eventually finishing school in Chicago. Remember, she was born in Kansas. Tornado took her to Chicago. Yeah, she had this weird theory that she got taken, and there was a... Don't worry. There was a witch. Wizard Oz. I was going yeah. for. I know no, that's that's what I was. I know what you were going well. for, but halfway through, I was like, "This isn't funny." I'm no. bailing out. <laughs> you're gonna bail out. Oh, the pun. Oh, oh yeah. It's yeah. What's your pun? Um, stow those tables and put the seats in the upright position, boy. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, good. I feel like I used that exact <laughs> joke in a plain one. Did you? Yeah, I feel like I've done that before. So, do I have to do another one? Yeah, you should. Okay. Um, Drop the landing gear and check your instruments because it's time for landing. No, I, I was purposely <laughs> pausing because I paused and then the pause became funny. So I let it go longer. <laughs> Crickets. Can you do like effects on voices? I mean, maybe. What do you want done? Like the radio? What? The, the, you know, like over the radio. Oh, like a car. radio effect. Yeah. Maybe. This is your captain speaking. Uh, the weather outside is sunny, about 22 degrees. Uh, flight time is approximately 50 minutes. Uh, we're ready for takeoff. Uh, let's go. If you can just add the little... <laughs> the, I'm not going to. Shit. Oh, come on. <laughs> now it's just you talking. Uh, After her grandparents passed away and her mother received her inheritance, the family were in a much better position and Amelia was able to go to Canada at one point to visit her sister and eventually would be drawn to nursing the wounded in World War I. Let's search out them facts, boy. Tell me what they are. <laughs> All right. Good job. <laughs> Good job. You got there in the end. You landed it eventually. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. Yeah, no crashing. No crashing for <laughs> no, you. No crashing burning for me. Ooh. Eventually, she became a nurse in Toronto. It's during her time as a nurse that she would encounter military pilots who would pique her interest in flying through their stories from the war. World War One. Yes. 30 seconds. Like- because World War Two hasn't happened yet, has it? No. World War Two is still two years away. Well, uh, hang on. This is in the 20s. Mm-hmm. So it's- Yeah. Oh, no, no. It's during World War One. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because so, it was 1919 when the war ended, right? So mainly like biplanes and mm. none of the- uh, None of the dope planes that came after. Mm-hmm. After surviving the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918, Earhart did spend months recovering from pneumonia and maxillary sinusitis. Is that when, like, the blood vessels in your sinuses, like, get blocked up or get Yeah, I think so. Yeah, she had to have a couple surgeries to, like, go and come out. Mm, gross. She would have her first trip in the air, uh, into the air in 1920 at an air show in Long Beach, California. She asked her father to book her a passenger flight, and once she had taken to the air, she is quoted as saying, by the time I had got two or three hundred feet off the ground... I knew I had to fly. What was the what was the flight in? What kind of plane? Uh, no idea. Didn't say. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Thank I you. imagine it would be a biplane. It's like the twenties. Well, That's pas- eight, nineteen eighteen. Mm. Yeah, but you can have a two seat biplane. Correct, but I don't think for a passenger passenger plane. I mean, we're not talking passenger planes like we know them. No, I know. I'm talking yeah. propeller, cabin, maybe stainless steel. Shiny oh, planet. no, it wouldn't have had a cabin. No planes with cabins at this point. Mm. They're all just biplanes or- mono- Open air cockpits. Yeah. Maybe. Just trying to think. From this first experience, Earhart would quickly book herself flying lessons with an instructor, paying $500 for 12 hours of instruction. You know, I've done a flying lesson, boy. I do know you've done mm. a flying lesson. How about you tell us the story? Oh. In excruciating detail. Flew what did you eat on the morning that you a, took it? We flew a plane, took off, landed- <laughs> That was it. You flew over Bribey, didn't you? Uh, we went out to South Australia. That's it. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Mm. I would love to get my pilot's license, I think. But then so also, I. I don't want to do all the work. I, I also would too. Yeah, it was pretty cool. We, we took off at uh, Archerfield, headed east out to the beach. Mm. The instruct- all of this geography? Just imagine you're flying. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, um, the instructor took over when we got to the beach and he took us right down pretty low. 
because there were some campers and four-wheel drives and we buzzed them a few times and then I took back over. And Do you reckon they liked back. that or they were like, piss off? Uh, I probably did. They were looking. You could, you could see they were looking. Yeah, of course they were. A plane was buzzing them. Mm. She would work. Work? She would work. She would work a vast array of jobs to earn the money to fuel her new passion. She's in Toronto, not Germany. <laughs> Go on, where's your Canadian accent? She would work. She would work a vast array of jobs, eh? <laughs> that was pretty American. You just went A at the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> Out. She would work a vast array of jobs, eh? Yeah, I can't do any voices now, apparently. <laughs> voices are my thing and I can't do them. Her jobs included being a photographer, truck driver, and stenographer. After her first lesson in January of 1921, Earhart would cut her hair short to match other female aviators of the day. And after her first successful solo landing, would buy her own leather flying coat. Ooh. After being teased for having a brand new coat, she would stomp it in the dust and stain it with aircraft oil to age it up. Gross. What a waste of a good leather coat. Don't you think that's so weird? Like yeah, these days, if you weird. see someone with something new, you're like, oh, that's nice. Like if like you walked like, out- oh, You're a noob. Yeah. If you walked out to cricket with brand new like pads and stuff, and I was just like, nerd. Uh, noob, it's his first day. <laughs> no runs for you. And then uh, tonk. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dirty him up. It is weird. Also in 1921, Earhart would buy her first plane, despite the urging of her instructor to avoid it. She would go on to use the plane to achieve a world record altitude for female pilots of 14,000 feet. What was the plane? Oh, I did. I looked this up. Oh, come on. I did look this up. I didn't include it. Just give me a second. I will find. The next sound you hear from me is my forehead hitting the microphone. You know why I didn't include it? Because nobody cares. I care. All right. John cares. If you cared, hashtag- Rick's cares. Cheekyversary, hashtag what was the plane, hashtag I'm a plane nerd, hashtag. Oh, don't you start at me for being a plane nerd, Mr. (laughs) I haven't seen the B2 yet. (laughs) You know, all day at cricket today when I was keeping (laughs) between balls, I was just turning around and looking at the sky. I was like, what's that noise? What's that plane? Also, I saw another C-17 when we were at the shops before. I'm like, piss off. It was doing laps. Yeah, very annoying. Uh, where's the first? So don't come at me about being a plane nerd when all you want to do is see the B-2s that are currently visiting our local air defense base. I did also go and plane watch to see aircraft, Air Force One. But, you know, who wouldn't? So, as if, if Air Force One was here, you're going out there. It was a bright chromium yellow Kinner Airster biplane. Cool. Okay, I've accidentally clicked on the color chrome yellow rather than Kin's, Kinner Airster biplane. Um, so, yeah, it just looks like a plane, uh, a bit of a biplane. Yep. Anyway, so she she set the world record of 14,000 feet, uh, marking her first foray into historic flight. It's pretty high for open air cockpit. Yeah. If but, you think about it, like, she'd probably be starting be, to struggle to breathe up there. would be cold. Oh, they'd still have, like, oxygen, didn't they? they, they had, no. Like, yeah, they, they had masks they put on. I don't think that's true. Anyway. She would eventually gain her pilot's license in May of 1923, becoming just the 16th woman in the US to be issued one. From here, though, there wasn't smooth sailing for Earhart, as she had trouble recouping the money she had spent getting her license. Did she hit a bit of turbulence? (laughs) She did, boy. There wasn't a lot of flying jobs going around in the 1920s, apparently. She lost a fair amount of money in a poor investment in a gypsum mine. She slowly ran out of inheritance from her grandmother until she had nothing left. She sold her planes, bought a car, and drove herself and her newly divorced mother to Boston. She would bounce around between jobs, but continued to fly throughout. She would become the vice president of the American Aeronautical Society's Boston chapter. This, along with no local notoriety brought about by newspaper columns she wrote about flying, would bring her to national attention soon enough. What are you looking up? Uh, When did pilots first start using oxygen in planes? Yeah. 1913. Uh, the RAF. Yep. Uh, they did it in 1918. Uh, they've done limited trials in 1918. So the first person to do it was French aviator. Oh. Uh-huh. Um, he flew a biplane to 20,000 feet. That's high. So I imagine if she was specifically going up to set a record for female, she probably would have had oxygen as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. 20,000 feet. That's unnecessary. John just flipped me off. Double bird. Very, 
unnecessary. You know the bird? I know the bird goose. You get that how, reference now. You actually get that reference now. How good was that movie? <laughs> so good. Have you seen the second one yet? I have not. Boy. I know. Oh, this, that, how you're feeling right now was how I felt I last recording about Wizard of Oz and every other movie I mentioned to you. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been copping it for not having seen that movie. <laughs> so you should. <laughs> Just about anyone that's listening is like, I can't believe you. <laughs> you disgust me. No, I have not seen Maverick yet. I, Boy, it's I possibly the greatest movie of all time. Mm. Mm. Is it? Yes. Okay. It's so good. All right. Uh, not to oversell it. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm going in with low expectations yeah, now. Just go in. It's not that great. <laughs> it's the greatest movie of all time. <laughs> Her first transatlantic flight. And that is? Across the Atlantic. From? Uh, it was from uh, Newfoundland to- America to England. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right. Thank well, you. I mean, it could have been from England to- Yeah, America. either way, I'm just clearing it up for the listeners, boy. I do cover off where they took off from and landed. Sure. Around the same time, so around the same time as she started gaining national notoriety, mm-hmm. promoters were looking for a woman to take part in a flight over the Atlantic Ocean, and due to her growing fame, Earhart would be top of the list. While some would say that she was sought out for her supposed resemblance of Charles Lindbergh, another episode coming in the future, who had completed the first transatlantic solo flight, it's hard to argue that she didn't deserve the flight with her skills. So they reckon she kind of looks like a female. Lindbergh. Okay. I don't really see it, but- Why is Charles Lindbergh going to be a future episode? Uh, well, th- because one, he's famous for mm-hmm. his flying. Mm-hmm. And two, his child went missing. Oh. Oh, him? Yes. I also know that story. Yes, you do. You should. Wow. Okay. I didn't realize that. Okay. There cool. you go. You can have that one. Nah, I'm good. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right, mister. I've got all the stories. I actually don't have a story for next episode, but well, there you I've go. Got this would be a nice takeoff fo- follow on sequel. Maybe I do the takeoff with this one, you do the landing uh, with the other one. Yeah, well, landing's the hardest part, so naturally I would do it. I would argue that takeoff's the hardest part, you know. Okay, as someone who's actually flown a plane to someone who's never flown a plane, oh, you didn't do takeoff <laughs> or landing, champ. I did take off, did you? Yeah, oh, really? Yeah, they let you take off, yeah. That seems dangerous. They didn't let me do the landing, but they yeah, let me do the ta- makes sense. It's take, the hardest part. Dude, takeoff is just engines. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Are we got enough speed? Pull back. Yeah, it makes sense. The landing's the hardest part. Mm. As I've always said. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Earhart would get the call and would gladly accept. While she wouldn't be flying the plane herself, she would assist the pilot and co-pilot and would keep the flight log. Considering Charles Lindbergh had only completed the first solo transatlantic flight a year earlier in 1927... It was still considered a very perilous flight, and with the prospect of the first female to fly across the Atlantic on board, the flight would gain a lot of media attention. The three would take flight on June 17, 1928, from Newfoundland, landing- that's Newfoundland, Canada. Or is that New Hampshire? Where is Newfoundland? Newfoundland or Newfoundland? It's Newfoundland. It- I think they call it Newfoundland, but not like New Finland, it's Newfoundland. It's spelt Newfoundland. Yes. Yeah. So original with the names. I know, right? What should we call this place? Newfoundland? I like it. <laughs> what do we call this newly found land? I have an idea. Yeah, it's Canada. There you go. I always thought it was Canada, but then doubted myself. And they would land in South Wales, exactly 20 hours and 40 minutes later. Earhart would not fly the plane at any time as most of the flight was conducted with just instruments and she wasn't yet trained for that. And when interviewed after the flight, she would say, Stultz, the pilot, did all the flying. He had to. I was just baggage, like a sack of potatoes. Maybe someday I'll try it alone, though. Despite not flying, Earhart would gain massive fame from the flight, with her and the crew being given a ticker tape parade in New York on their return to the States and were even sent to meet the president. I do love that quote. I'm like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> she was a bit sassy. Like, there's yeah. a few quotes from her that are like- I'm just trying to think of who the president was at the time. 28. Well, it was not anyone that I knew. It was one of those, okay. like, nobody presidents. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Nobody presidents. <laughs> nobody presidents. <laughs> Cop, Cop that. that. <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> <laughs> Take that, most American presidents. Oh, Earhart would go on to leverage her- f- By the way, I just love it. I'm just taking shots at presidents. You well, might as well. Everyone else in America can. Oh! Gun violence. Cheeky Tail says, 
not okay. <laughs> Cheeky Tails says no to automatic rifles. The the official stance of Cheeky Tails is no to automatic rifles <laughs> and stricter legislation on guns. But yes to muskets. Okay. And 308s taking out rats. <laughs> <laughs> Our stance is complicated, but it is firm. (laughs) Earhart would go on to leverage her fame by completing lecture tours, publishing a book, which was called 20 Hours and 40 Minutes. By chance, is that how long it took to fly the transatlantic? Yes. That seems really long. Yeah. Probably much quicker than it took the Titanic. Oh, because it never made it. (laughs) (laughs) It's still going. (laughs) Record. Slowly, (laughs) on the bottom of the sea, (laughs) slowly traveling. Ripped all those people. She also, <laughs> RIP to real ones. And product endorsements was the last part of that sentence. So she did product endorsements. Cool. She would even end up with her own line of clothing Ooh. that she would promote. She wouldn't just shill though. as she or, We would though. And she would also <laughs> use her fame. <laughs> Any companies listening, we definitely would shill. <laughs> she would also use her fame to push forward the cause of aviation with the public. Oh, publishing. Hey. I was going to say, we need to share this with the bug assault people. Oh, we really we shilled do. out to them too. Get onto them. She would also publish columns in Cosmo and would help to promote air travel among the public with her promotion of commercial airlines for domestic travel. Cosmo was a thing back then? Mm-hmm. What were their articles? Let our him planes, see your apparently. ankles, ladies. <laughs> Show him your ankles. He'll go wild. <laughs> yeah. Is that, what, is that what it was? I guess. I can't imagine what. I've never read 1920s it. Cosmo is probably like today's kids' magazine. I've honestly never read a Cosmo, but I've heard of what their articles are like. Here's 19 things that you can eat that'll make you lose weight. <laughs> yeah, probably. Nine of them are poison. <laughs> Strict nine. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you need on your face, ladies? Lead-based paint. <laughs> Aluminium-based paint. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, the 30s. What a time. She would continue to fly, completing the first solo flight for a woman across the North American continent in both directions. She would compete in competitive air racing. <laughs> Competitive air racing. Red Bull was around then, wasn't it? It was Red Bull founded. (laughs) Red Bull will... Honestly, I'm surprised Red Bull don't sponsor us. Um, Why? Because they sponsor everything. Oh, you're true. Red Bull, we will shield. I'll shield for Red Bull. I love the taste of Red Bull. (laughs) I shook my head. (laughs) I've never tried it. (laughs) But please, we'll take your money. (laughs) I'll drink it if you give me money. Uh, she, yeah, so she competed in competitive air racing through 1929 and would even set a world record height in an autogyro, the precursor to helicopters. Mm. So she likes height, apparently. In 1932- Flying planes, what other records can you get apart yeah, I from guess height fastest, at the time? Longest, better, faster, longer, stronger. That's not the exact quote, but you know what I'm going for. In 1932, Earhart would complete the flight that would concrete her mystique in the eye of the public completing just the second transatlantic flight ever from Newfoundland to Northern Ireland. That's solo, by the way. And that was in 32? Yes. Was that in the DC-9? The DC-9? Yeah. The three-jet plane. You mean... the Is the DC-9 the jet? DC-9's a jet, yes. Okay, what am I thinking of then? This, this, the reflective silver... That's all of them. Twin prop. Are you thinking of the Electra? No, that's the one she... Is it? That's the one she's going to fly later on. Yes. Is the DC-9... Is that the de Havilland? Oh, no, the McDonnell Douglas DC-9. Yeah, that is that is a two-jet plane. I'm thinking of the, the McDonnell Douglas DC-2. That's what I'm thinking of. Oh, yeah. And it was uh, released in 1934. So I'm going to say no, that's not... <laughs> she didn't do it in that. No, she did not. So, yeah, she completed the second transatlantic flight ever. During the flight... She would contend with strong winds, icy cold conditions, ice on the wings, and mechanical problems, including a leak in the fuel tank and a cracked manifold in the engine that resulted in actual flames flying back at her. Wow. She would also complete the first ever flight from Hawaii to California and complete the first non-stop solo flight from Mexico to New York. I feel like flying in the early 30s was like the Wild West. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, everyone's just going for records. Yeah, but also, like, stuff goes wrong. Mm. Easily. Yeah, it's not like today where flying is the safest form of travel. Yeah, like there's not really the maintenance standards or the safety standards yeah. we have today. Like it was just like, oh, yeah, the wing cracked. Uh, we landed all right. Just patch it up. From here, the world would be watching when she set off on her planned round-the-world flight in 1937. But before we get there, let's talk quickly about Fred Noonan, the other person to go missing. 
as he's rarely ever mentioned. That was the most awkward way I've ever seen a person grab a beer. You're like flicking it like this as you move around. Nailed it though, right? Yeah, yeah. Good job. No, no, no spillages. No. What do you think? I mean, I've got some in my fridge and I drank some just the other week. It's, oh, this exact one. It's Pirate's Booty, isn't it? Pirate's Booty? Or Pirate, Pirate Life, South Coast House. <laughs> yeah, this is the one I got at home. Yes, it is the Pirate's Booty. Love me some Pirate's Booty. Yeah, you do, you <laughs> dirty boy. Do you like some Pirate Booty? Yeah, you <laughs> well, you didn't mention it'd be Pirate's Booty. <laughs> oh, just a little bit of Pirate Booty. A little bit of Pirate Booty. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, if you don't know what we're referencing. <laughs> oh, that's not getting in the episode, is it? <laughs> Probably not. I love, okay. If anyone checks it out, it's Auntie Donna, just in case it makes it in as a little bit or something. Christmas pudding. For, yeah, it's Christmas pudding, but for the masses, if you want to check out Auntie Donna, check out their skit. The Christmas stra- pudding. The Stranger. This is for the masses to get into their comedy. Oh, okay. Who, which stars Anthony Starr. Anthony Starr. Uh, as people might know him as Homelander from the popular TV show, The Boys. Oh, there you go. Hmm. Cool. Is that the one? That's the- All right. I think it's The Stray. I think it's the title of the story. Yeah. Well, if that makes it in, great story. Maybe a little bit of pirate booty. <laughs> <laughs> Who was Fred Noonan? Honestly, poor Noons gets a bad deal with the disappearance, as people mostly focus on Amelia and totally forget old Freddy. Frederick Joseph Noonan was born on April 4th, 1893 in Illinois to parents Joseph and Catherine. Catherine would pass away when he was just four, and little is known of his time after that, though it's likely his father moved to Chicago and Fred would grow up with his relatives. At the age of 17, he would find work as a seaman, working on over a dozen ships, eventually working on merchant ships during World War I. As was the norm, he would work on three boats that would be sunk by German U-boats, somehow surviving the plunge into the Atlantic Why waters Why is that the norm, <laughs> just for him? That just seems like lots of ships got sunk. Yeah, yeah they did, but it's just- Oh, yeah, it's my- pff, I, Don't send your stuff on this ship. I'm on it. It's going <laughs> to get sunk by a German U-boat. It's going down. But to survive three, that's pretty- Yeah. That's, that's pretty good. That's a good effort. He would continue to work in the Merchant Navy through the 1920s and would eventually marry his wife, Josephine, in 1927. Fred, in a similar fashion to Amelia, would find himself interested in flight and would take to the skies during his time on land during during the night. (laughs) (laughs) This cough needs to go away. All right, take it from the top boy and take 23. Fred, in a similar fashion to Amelia, would find himself interested in flight and would take the skies and would take- Take 24. (laughs) And would take to the skies during his time on land during the 1920s learning to fly and getting his pilot's license. Paired with his skills from his time in the seas, this would make Noonan a skilled navigator, and he would decide on a career change in the 1930s, becoming a navigator for Pan Am. Rising through the ranks quickly, he would eventually be responsible for mapping much of the routes of uh, much of the routes that Pan Am would use through the Pacific Ocean, flying all over the Asian and Southeast Asian islands. In 1937, Noonan was again starting to feel the need for a change in jobs and would eventually resign from Pan Am with the vague thought of starting a navigational school. Before doing that, though, he would meet Amelia Earhart through mutual connections in the aviation world. And as the two learnt each other's talents, Earhart would eventually choose Noons to be her navigator for her ambitious attempt to complete a trip around the world. So that's Noons. Covered him pretty quickly. On your Noonie. The Round the World Flight and Disappearance. In 1936, Earhart would begin planning her round the world trip. While it wouldn't be the first to be completed, it was planned to be the longest, flying a total of 29,000 miles and pretty much following the equator around the world. And it's not non stop, is it? It's stopping at just the destinations. That's right. So the leg that they went missing on was leg 40. Mm hmm. Mm. She would have a Lockheed Electra 10E custom built for the trip, with much of the fuselage dedicated to extra fuel tanks and radio equipment. Noons would not be the first choice for Navigator, with a man called Henry Manning initially chosen. But during test flights, Manning would be up to 20 miles off with his positions, and so would be dropped in favour of Fred Noons, who also brought the experience of navigating via the stars. Right, because he was a seaman. 
He was a seaman. He knew the stars. Mm -hmm. Mm. On March 17, 1937, Earhart and her crew would take off on their first attempt. They would head from California to Honolulu, where the plane would need some work done to the propellers. Three days after landing in Honolulu, they would attempt to take off again to head to Howland Island, which was in the middle of the Pacific between Hawaii and Australia. On takeoff, though, the plane would go into an uncontrolled spin on the runway caused by a tyre blowout, which caused the landing gear to collapse and the plane to take serious damage. The plane would be shipped back to California for repairs, while Earhart would prepare for another attempt. So, not going great to begin with. In their first attempt, they're flying west. Yes. So, they're going west, or west, east to west. Yes. Yeah. East to west? No, west. They're flying to the west. Yes. So east west. Yeah, east west. Mm-hmm. The second attempt would begin. Can you picture that though? Why just, do you always wait till I start the sentence? Because it's funny. Yeah. Plane just cruising down the runway. <laughs> just starts spinning out of yeah. control. Like, not yeah. only is that terrifying if you're the pilot. Imagine being the one not in control. Ugh. I just can't imagine a plane spinning out of control like that. Like, no. it just doesn't seem possible. No. Like, in these days, they don't just have one tire. So. Yeah, if it's a tire like blows, a four or something. Yeah, you don't really know unless you're on the Concord. Um, another episode coming in the future. Well, that wasn't the Concord, Concord's tire that did the Concord in. Yeah. No. Yeah. What am I thinking of that had uh, an, uh, the plane that took off before had a blowout, which was then sucked up into the plane that took off afterwards, and that's what caused the issue. I thought that was the Concord. No, so the Concord was – we're going to get into the bit. I want to do this as an episode. Right, but well, okay. Yeah, a tyre blowout caused that. Yeah. The second attempt would begin on May 20th of 1937. So this is uh, two months later. This time going the opposite direction, flying from California to Miami. They actually didn't tell anyone that they were doing the first bit. They just kind of took off. Mm-hmm. And then when they got to Miami, they were like, oh, by the way, everyone, we're doing a world trip. See ya. And then flew. And what was the reasoning for going the opposite direction this time? Uh, the winds, uh, weather around the globe, basically. The winds had changed. It was going to be easier to fly that way. Okay. Yeah. Eventually, after fairly standard flying for about a month, they would touch down in Lae, New Guinea, on June 29th. From here, it was planned that they would fly from Lae to Howland Island, which I mentioned before. Which where they were going from Honolulu. Yes. On the previous attempt. Mm -hmm. On July 2nd. Yes. So, this Howland Island, I think basically they had to go from Lae to Howland Island to Hawaii home. Mm -hmm. And that was it. At 10 a.m. on the morning of July 2nd, the flight would take off with the most fuel that it carried during the expedition. Told you I'd say that. Planning (laughs) to cover uh, 2,223 nautical miles, miles, miles on the day. Earhart had a schedule to call Harry Belfour, the radio operator in Lae, every hour of the trip. Once the plane had taken off, Balfour noted that the headwinds were stronger than expected and would attempt to radio this to Earhart three times without success. It seemed Earhart's radio wasn't working as expected. Headwinds would affect speed, fuel consumption and flight time and so it would be expected that Earhart would work this out during the flight regardless. Eventually, Earhart would make contact at 2.18pm and she would report that the flight was progressing well. It's important you say this because GPS didn't exist. No. And so for them to go where they're going, they've got, to, they've got to time it out with their speed to work out how far they've actually travelled yeah, to try and, and work out where they are on a map or something. And they don't really have a ton of things to see. No. Like it's mostly just water. Especially that's the Pacific. So it's yeah. just a lot of water out there. So by the way, keep in mind it was 10 a.m. when they took off. Mm-hmm. And they're flying east. So this. They're flying towards the sunrise. Yeah so, yeah, so the sun will be going quicker in the sky, I suppose. Yeah. She was flying at 140 knots at 7,000 feet. An hour later, so about 3 p.m., 3.20 p.m., she would report that they had climbed to 10,000 feet, which despite not being economical, is theorised by other pilots of the day to be to avoid clouds or mountains in the area. Despite this, they were making good time towards Howland Island. Near Howland Island was the US Coast Guard vessel Itasca. It was to provide radio transmissions for the flight as it got close to its destination. As the sun rose, it's estimated they were down to just 97 gallons of fuel, but the radio signal to the Itasca was getting stronger and stronger. 
It got so strong, in fact, that the radio operator on the Itasca went outside to look for the plane at one point. Despite this, neither Earhart or the Itasca could see each other, with Earhart radioing, We must be on you, but I cannot see you. Gas is running low. So you said the sun rose. So you said it was 3 p.m. Is it now like... It is now about 8 a.m. So that so was a... had been flying for 20 hours at this Yeah, point. that was a bit of a time jump from when you said it was 3 yeah. p.m. to like sun rose. Yeah. So they've only gone like two time zones over. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a 20-hour flight at this point. Mm-hmm. Just think about that. She's been awake that whole time. Yeah. Because Noons is not really flying the plane. No, he's navigating. Mm. He is the GPS. You've arrived at your destination. Not. At the white cap wave. (laughs) Make a left. Her final transmission, received at 8.43am, was, We are on the line 157 degrees, 337 degrees. We will repeat message. We will repeat this on 6,210 kilocycles. Wait. Earhart's voice was said to be frantic, which is understandable given the absolute terror that sounds to be. After this final transmission, neither Earhart or Noonan were heard from again, and the search would begin. As mentioned earlier, the search would go for 16 days, including many vessels and aircraft from the aircraft carrier. There would be no trace of Earhart or Noonan found, and to this day, there is no definitive evidence that any trace has been found of them or their plane. So essentially, they were like, hey, we're on this line, we're going up and down it, we don't know where you are. Mm. Um, but at some point, they were super close to that Itasca. Just because the radio transmission was very strong. Yeah. So, yeah, the right. guy's gone outside and he's like, oh, I'm looking around for him. Where are they? Can't see him. Can't hear them. Weird. Yeah. Super weird. Would you like to hear some theories? Uh, firstly, yes, I would. Yes. Secondly, mm. the place that they were going to. Howland Island. Very small. Oh, tiny. Like, yeah. It's only a couple of kilometers yeah, it is, a, it is a small Pacific island. Like, what's the total land size that they're trying to aim for? Total this, size it, of Howland Island. Let's find out. I think it's like four kilometers wide and like maybe eight kilometers long. Howland Island is an uninhabited coral island located just north of the equator in the central Pacific Ocean, about 1,700 nautical miles or 3,100 kilometers southwest of Honolulu. Uh... The island, <laughs> the island has an elongated cucumber shape on a north-south axis, 1.4 by 0.55 miles, or 2.25 kilometers by 0.89 kilometers. A point eight. What did I say? Eight. No. So yeah, it is. It's not a kilometer two and wide. A quarter by not even a kilometer wide, yeah. and covers 2.6 square kilometers. So they're they're trying to find a pin in. That is tiny. Yeah. That's probably smaller than some housing estates. You reckon there was lights? There would have been lights on. Oh, it was sunrise. It was the morning, yeah. So, yeah, that is a tiny Trying little speck, speck in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. And looking at the uh, the aerial photography in 2007, there ain't nothing there, bruh. <laughs> it, is, it is a tiny little I'm sure speck. you'll post that one on the socials. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so- not on, yeah, like my point is they're trying to find this tiny little island in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. So, yeah, they just um, disappeared. No one saw them, so they weren't close. <laughs> so, they, they didn't even get close to the island, um, which is strange because they could be heard. Yeah. All right, let's hear some theories. So, I'm going to go from most reasonable to most ridiculous, and there's four of them. Okay. Theory one, they done run out of fuel. This theory is pretty simple and states that they just ran out of fuel. Um, In this theory, it's guessed that the plane ended up crashing into the ocean northwest of Howland Island. With the Electra they were flying, it should have had 24 hours worth of fuel, uh, but they crashed just after 20. But this can be explained with the strong headwinds and high altitude flight, which would have caused the plane to chew through a lot more fuel a lot faster than normal. Now, the high altitude flight is because there's less air. The higher up, so yeah. So when it, with a prop plane, you need more propulsion for. Yeah, well, with a prop plane, there's less air, so you have to work the engine harder to be just yeah, as to push fast. through the air. Yeah. yeah. Um, the ocean near the island is also incredibly deep at eighteen thousand feet, Woo. and there was a fifteen-year sonar mapping campaign in the area, but they didn't find it. They didn't find anything. Yeah, wow. Mm. And the ocean's deeper than they were in the air. Yeah. You got to think like it, it's kind of like MH370, right? 
There is so much ocean to investigate. It's no wonder we haven't found it. What ocean did that go? What was that? That was the Pacific. That was like off Perth somewhere, they reckon. Well, I mean, they don't even know. That's not the Pacific. That's the Indian, Indian. isn't it? Yeah. The Pacific is this one. Duh. <laughs> what an idiot. Did he even do geography in year 10? Yeah. The answer is yes, and I was really good at it. Um, Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I got the award, as did someone else, but screw them. So, that one, honestly, to me, that one feels like the correct one, right? That they just ran out of fuel. Oh, I want to hear the rest first before I make my judgment. Okay, fair enough. I think, I think number four is the one you're going to love. The castaway theory. Similar number four, is number four aliens? You know it's aliens. <laughs> <laughs> the castaway theory. Similar to the previous theory, this one is based on the plane running out of fuel, but this time landing on the exposed beach of the coral atoll Nicaromo. 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 There you go. Nicaromo. 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 There you go. Nicaromo. Cool. Sorry, everyone. The Thanks atoll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't believe I said that properly the first time. <laughs> Editing. The atoll sits on the navigation line 157337, so it stands to reason that they may have flown over it during their attempt to find Howland Island. It does also kind of have a similar shape, um, but like- Like a cucumber? Yeah, big old cuke. Um, but it's got kind of like water in the middle. In either 1939 or 1940, a British officer found a campsite on the island, as well as the remains of tools to navigate using the stars. More interestingly, though, he found a partial skeleton, as well as 12 other bones. A physician working in Fiji determined that the bones wouldn't have belonged to Earhart or Noonan, as they belonged to a man who was short, stocky, and European. He then inexplicably discarded the bones, so destroyed them, so they couldn't be investigated again. What an idiot. I I know. There's so many things- like. There's so many mysteries where you hear something like this. Like the bones like, were lost or they were yeah. just chucked out. Like, like um, JFK, JFK's head. JFK's skull missing. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Someone just lost it. You Muppet. Yeah. So he's just like, well, they're not Earhart. Bin. So who was it then? Well, they don't know. They don't have any, like, they don't have any pieces of them left. And there was two, two sets. So there was 12 bones and a partial skeleton. I mean- it's plausible, right? That's the line that they were flying on, and there's two lots of skeletons. This, I don't think this island's meant to be habited, right? It is uninhabited, yeah. So there's a campsite. And when was the when was it discovered? Two or three years later. It's, it's plausible. This theory gets better. In recent years, though, the International Group for Historical Aircraft Recovery commissioned a study that showed that measurements of the bones as well as uh, updated databases of bone structure, showed that the bones could have belonged to a taller-than-average woman of European descent, which would match Earhart. Mm. And um, this is where it gets a little bit fun. Have they scanned the area for, like, plane wreckage? No. You know, this is the sonar mapping? Yeah. Mm. Because So this is where it gets a little bit fun. Mm. You remember that I said it was a partial skeleton and only 12 other bones? Mm Mm-hmm. It's theorised that the rest of the skeletons were carried off by coconut crabs and that Earhart and Noonan may have been eaten by crabs either before or after they died. Considering coconut crabs can crack actual coconuts and can grow up to three feet long. They are, I, they're massive. They coconut, are huge. Coconut crabs are scary. <laughs> yeah. I think it's entirely possible. If you don't like spiders, don't look up coconut crabs. D- if you don't like spiders, do not have a look at our social media at Cheeky Tales Pod on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Coconut crabs are scary mofos. Yeah, I'm going to be putting a photo up. They are huge. I feel it, I they feel almost like, look not real. I feel like it's possible. I wouldn't say they were killed by coconut crabs. No, I'm going to say they were starvation or yeah, something happened. Dehydration got them, and then mm. I believe the coconut crabs probably would have cleaned them up. It's also believed that a photo taken in 1937 by a British expedition to the island shows the landing gear of a plane sticking out of the water near the coast of Nicaromo. I said it wrong again. Mm. Nicaromo. If the plane had not been entirely immersed, it's also possible that the plane's radio could have been used when the tide was low for up to a week. 
considering there were several radio transmissions supposedly received during this week by a woman named Betty Clank, including, this is Amelia Earhart, help me, and water's knee deep, let me out. It's entirely possible that this theory has some validity. Clank apparently heard transmissions for three hours, but when reported to the Coast Guard, they were dismissed, along with dozens of other messages supposedly received from Earhart all over the world. There is also the problem that there is no physical evidence to back this theory up, as well as the fact that the Navy flew over the atoll on July 9th and saw no evidence of anyone on the beach. So it's a little bit of like supportive evidence and a little bit of maybe not. Yeah, they say they saw nothing, but there's clearly a campsite and- Yeah, so someone's been- Human remains. Yeah. And then you've also got to consider like, what if this bloke's lying too? He's just like, oh, I found these bones on the island. Yeah, true. Mm. Uh, yeah, I had heard of the phantom radio messages before. Wasn't it a little, like a 12-year-old girl or boy yes. also heard? Betty Clank, 12. Oh, you said woman, sorry. Young woman, whatever. Girl. I think there's also another one. People all over the world were saying that they heard messages from her. Mm. So, what are you going to do? Mm. It's a bit of, bit, of, bit of yay, bit of nay. Yeah. Especially like, I wouldn't, it's hard to say that, the Navy pilots flew over and looked and saw nothing and then like lied about seeing nothing. Yeah. I can't imagine they would have seen something went. <laughs> yeah. Also like they may not have set up a fire by then, but mm. then if the plane wasn't fully submerged, it like you said, high tide, it. it was sunk. And- yeah. So it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this one, but the crabs, I like the idea of the crabs. <laughs> Eating them. That's a bit rough. What are you going to do? It's nature. Don't die on a deserted mm. island. Crabs have, um, over history, got one back. <laughs> <laughs> All the crabs we've eaten. They sure are delicious. <laughs> Theory three, the international woman of mystery. Mm. Oh, yes. A retired, US, US, a retired U.S. Air Force colonel brings us the third theory, stating that Amelia Earhart was actually a spy. He believes that Earhart and Noonan were told if they couldn't land at Howland Island, they should fly to the Marshall Islands, which were 800 miles away, and ditch the plane there. This was to allow the American Navy to search around the islands for reconnaissance, as they were occupied by the Japanese at the time. Multiple Marshallese locals have claimed that they saw Earhart's plane crash into the ocean, though obviously this couldn't be proven. The theory states that the plane was intercepted, however, and that Earhart and Noonan were captured by the Japanese. The theory then splits between the pair being executed and being held captive until the end of World War II, at which point they were released and assumed new identities on their return to the States. Earhart is said to have become Irene Craigmile, and then after marriage, Irene Bolam. However, this particular theory falls apart when you discover that Irene Bolam sued, successfully, the author of a book that claimed this theory, and doesn't really look like Earhart much at all. Isn't there also a photo, a Japanese photo, of a woman matching... Earhart's description standing in front of a Electra type plane. So there is, not in front of a plane, there is a theory that this photo that was taken shows Earhart and Noonan on a dock, mm. uh, sort of like on a jetty um, in the Marshall Islands. Um, it turns out uh, that's a bit of dog poo because that <laughs> photo was taken in 1935. Oh, okay. Yeah, and published in a book in 1935. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So a couple of years before. Another thing that I read was that the Japanese theory didn't exist at first. Mm-hmm. It was only a few years afterwards when a movie was produced during World War II that was like a propaganda movie that showed Earhart being a spy and being oh, okay. cap- captured. Um, and also because there was a photo of her in a kimono. And so people were like, look, she's in a kimono. The Japanese have her. Mm. But that was all just kind of propaganda yeah, in right. World War II. Yeah. It should also be noted that there's no chance the plane could have made it back to the Marshall Islands with the amount of fuel that it had, and it would have crashed into the ocean. So, you know, bit of a sieve of a theory there. Not possible. Doesn't hold much water. Unlike yeah. the plane. Ho! Oh. I mean, anyway. I, I don't really like that theory. I, nah. like, I like the she became someone else, and then the woman that is actually being, like, <laughs> told that she's Amelia so, Earhart is like, how about... I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I'm my own person. You're this person. Mm, no. How about I sue you? Theory four. Aliens. 
It's actually aliens. <laughs> and by the way, I've got these laid out with like a number and then the title. Mm-hmm. All the others are just bold. This one's bold and italic. Ooh. Aliens. In space, no one can hear you scream. Tell me you've seen that movie. Which one's that? Alien. Oh, yeah. Aliens? Yes. Aliens the first one, right? Or yes. is And then Aliens is the second one. Correct. I have seen all three. There's four. The fourth one came out recently, right? No. Was there four? Yeah, Alien Resurrection. Oh, well, I haven't seen that one. Yeah. I do like that one and two are the exact same plot line. Yeah. No, it's a bit different. Tell me how it's different. Ooh, we're, more we're not of getting them. into it. We're Alien getting- and Aliens are the same movie. <laughs> Goes to sleep on a ship. Wakes up. Oh, there's an alien. That's pretty much it. Alien and Aliens, same movie. They're, they're different genres, though. Okay. They're the same movie. No, they're different. Well, isn't Top Gun and Top Gun Maverick the same movie? I mean, you could argue, yes. Isn't Episode 4 and Episode 7 the same movie? Yeah. And Kenobi, the series, the same as Episode 4? No. What? How they, is Kenobi the same they as They go four? off to rescue the princess. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sure. <laughs> How about we just say that everything is everything? Yeah, okay. Mm. Aliens. I mean, I don't mean to mock Star Wars. I love Star Wars. Sorry, Star Wars. <laughs> Nerd. You're my babe. <laughs> this theory is possibly my favorite mm-hmm. because not only is it absolute batshit, <laughs> it plays on the people will believe anything they see on TV trope. In 1995, an episode of Star Trek Voyager showed <laughs> the crew of the Voyager discovering a group of humans who had been abducted in 1937 including Earhart and Noonan. Oh, really? I want to watch this episode now. I really want to watch this episode. After this aired, a poll of Americans found about 7.3% of Americans believed that she was abducted. Now, that number is not exact. I actually couldn't find the article that I read about that, so I just made up 7.3 because it was about close. (laughs) But there was a percentage of Americans that was above five. So what you're saying is 92% of percentages are made up. That's correct. Mm -hmm. But no, I did read something about there was a percentage of Americans that mm-hmm. was like somewhere around 7.3 um, that believed after that episode that she was abducted. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So some people are like, oh, she went up to 10,000 feet because she was avoiding other ships. The alien ships. Yeah. Mm. It's just that very classic alien trope of, of like- I really, oh. I really want to find that episode now and watch it. Yeah. Um, apparently- it Sounds fun. In the episode, they find them and they wake them up. They're in like a stasis, Mm -hmm. like they were abducted. And um, Noonan's just like trying to shoot him with his gun. He's like, come here, I'm going to get you. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. That is literally the only thing that links. Is that it? People just think it's because of the TV show. (laughs) That's it. No other evidence of anything spooky going on. So after all that, there's like you said earlier, there's no actual evidence of where they landed or. Nope. They haven't been found to this day. No, there's been like pieces of plane found and people believe that maybe that's part of the plane, but then other people are like, mm, it's absolutely not. Um, I I assume they've not found anything at Nicarom, Nicar, Nicar, Nick, Nicar, Nicarom, the place that I said before that I can't get right. <laughs> Nicaroma, Nicaromo? Nicaromo. 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 Anyway. Nicaromo, row, row, you boat. <laughs> row, 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 you Nicaromo. <laughs> Um, yeah, so they've they've kind of found bits. They reckon recently they were like, oh, I, we found her, but they haven't really. Um, so, yeah, it's it's still a mystery to this day what happened to old Earhart. And that is the episode. Good episode, boy. Thank you. Nice condensed version. It is a bit short, which I am no, happy No, no, about. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's just it was good. All the information's there. It is all there. It's good. All of it. There's no more information. Um, Don't go looking. What you know, I go looking for Earhart. You, you and I go out, take a plane. We'll get a pilot's license. And oh, we'll yeah, go let's find, do that. Yeah, absolutely. We'll go find her. We couldn't get the rat race done, so let's do that. Instead of you racing a rat, <laughs> we'll just find Amelia Earhart. It would be nice. I'm, I'm sure. Hey, wasn't there less than twelve months ago? Wasn't there yes. a development? Yeah, there was something, but it, they w- just found like some wreckage of something. Okay. But I don't know if it's been definitively yeah okay investigated properly yet. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. One of the great airtime music um, mysteries. Yeah, and it hit, it hit all of our favourite bases, <laughs> which I really enjoyed. Yeah. When I was writing it, I was like, oh, this is a mystery episode. And then I'm like, got to the Fred Noonan bit where he's a guy on a boat. And I'm like, oh, 
boats again. Boats again, expeditions yeah. again, <laughs> going across the Atlantic again. Yeah. At least they made it. Ho! <laughs> Got him. No, good episode. Thanks for that, boy. Um, That's all right. Happy cheek anniversary! Happy cheek anniversary! Thank you to everyone who has listened to us over the last year. Yes, yes. That we, is a very good point. Thank you tremendously. Unbelievably grateful that you have a listen to these episodes. You take 45 to 50 minutes out of your week. 45 to 50. Most of our episodes are over an hour. Okay. Uh, roughly around <laughs> an hour out of your fortnight to listen to us. Yammer on about some story. Yeah. I, I have a few really fun ones that I want to do and one really dark one. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I don't, oh, Yes, I do know about that one. I don't really know how to do that one without just being like sad the whole time. I mean, I did Dolphin House. That one wasn't dark. That was funny. Yeah, but it was icky. <laughs> it was very icky. You might just have to put the content warning at the start of it again. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. Thank you for listening for a year. And we are going to continue with this for as long as we've got stories to tell. Um, if you would like to see some extra images from this week's episode, go to at Cheeky Tales Pod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll be putting up some photos there. And it would be great if you could add your commentary and let us know if you've got any episode suggestions. Yes. This one, as I said before, came from Reese. Keep engaging, please. We will always take suggestions yes. for episodes yes, and content. Absolutely. because And we will shill out to any sponsors that are willing to listen to us <laughs> and pay us money. <laughs> if you've got money and you want it to not be your money, but to be my money, I would like that money. Our. Please. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Sorry, boy. <laughs> you- we will plug the crap out of your product, even if oh, it's yeah. dog shit. I'll get a tattoo. <laughs> oh, hey, there you go. <laughs> I we'll get a tattoo. He said it. It's recorded. Our first sponsor that gives us over $1,000, I will get a tattoo on my arm. Of their logo? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to hold that as a challenge. I'm going <laughs> to get us a sponsor <laughs> of 1001 cent. 1001 cent. Because it's over $1,000 yep. to get you a tattoo. If you can get an actual sponsorship from an actual company that's not your mate, a thousand and one cent. Can I make a business and donate a thousand dollars? I will get. I will get the brand logo on my arm. <laughs> there you go. That's as long as it's not offensive. Okay, we're not getting Dick McFloggins <laughs> pizzas or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> McFloggins. All right. So that's sorry, Dick McFloggins pizza, but you're out anyway. <laughs> I think that's a good wrap-up point, don't you? I'll catch you in a fortnight. See you in a fortnight. (laughs) Thank you. Good night.